I guess I'll just say that uh, I was a first year fellow 10 years ago around this time and it was actually at that time I was, it was just about this time of the year that I was on the lymphoma service as a first year fellow and Craig was my attending and um, I did not know him before working here and as far as everyone, you know, I'm not related to him. <laughs> um, but. Uh, when I got to work with him, I really was blown away by what a tremendous teacher he is and, and, and clinician, and I so much wanted to work with him and um, thought about not working with him just because of my last name, which seemed like a silly idea, and it certainly was uh, the best decision that I've made, and you know, he's um, obviously had a tremendous impact on my career, and um, I feel so grateful and never thank him, and I'm sorry <laughs> that I never thank you, but I, I should thank him every day for taking me on as a fellow at that time. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about relapse and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma and, um, and talking about some of the novel agents, which Craig has already mentioned. Um, so this is the, uh, a, a very simplistic uh, picture of the treatment pathway for Hodgkin lymphoma. And as you just heard about the frontline therapy that Craig just mentioned, and about 80% of the patients are cured with the frontline therapy, and I'm gonna be touching upon all the different, uh, uh, different aspects of the other parts of the pathway. And in particular, I'm gonna be talking about the, um, the recently approved drugs, brentuximab, as well as nivolumab, and, um, and really thinking about incorporating these novel agents, mostly in the second line setting, because that's where we've done a lot of the work. Um, so as far as the active agents in, in Hodgkin lymphoma um, that we would consider for our patient in the post-transplant setting, this is just a, a laundry list of the various different agents that we would consider that have been tested in Hodgkin lymphoma. And as I mentioned, the ones that we'll be really focusing on are brentuximab and the checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and so starting with brentuximab, um, the actual approved indications for brentuximab, which I have to remind myself on a daily basis because I feel like we're often using it off-label, um, but the approved indications are for patients who have, had, who have failed two multi-agent regimens and who have failed a transplant. And then also um, it is approved for, for maintenance following transplant. Um, as, as Craig already mentioned, it's being looked at in multiple different settings. Um, in the frontline setting, we are awaiting the uh, results of the Echelon 1 study, which I think maybe we'll have in 2018 or so. Um, and, um, and that you know, very possibly will be practice changing. Um, in the second line setting, I'm going to talk about various different settings in which brentuximab is being looked at as well as nivolumab. Um, and, then, and then in addition, brentuximab is being looked at in combination with other novel agents such as mosestinostat, which is a, a phase one study that we have open here. Um, so just beginning with the, uh, the, study, the data that led to approval for brentuximab, this was the, uh, the pivotal study that was led by Dr. Yunus um, in which 102 patients who had failed transplant um, were enrolled. And as you can see here, um, the efficacy was um, quite good with almost every patient having some degree of clinical response and the overall response rate was 76% with about a third of the patients having a complete response to treatment. We now have five-year follow-up from that study, and as you can see, although um, many of the patients have progressed, you can see that there is a plateau on these curves, and it's interesting that um, now five years out, there's actually um, about 10% of the patients who were originally enrolled in the study who had complete responses to treatment actually remain in remission despite never having receiving any additional treatment after brentuximab, um, and so I, I find that quite interesting to um, you know, the idea that possibly for a very small group of patients, it's potentially curable for those patients. Um, but given that it was so active for patients who had failed transplant, the next question was, well, maybe it can be used for patients who uh, have gone through transplant and who are in remission and to try to reduce their risk for having their lymphoma come back. Um, so that was the premise of the Athera study that Craig has led. Um, and this was a randomized placebo-controlled study for patients with relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma who had um, gone on to receive a transplant, and they were then randomized to either placebo or brentuximab for a year. Um, there were 329 patients uh, on this study, and these are the overall results. Um, in, for the progression-free survival, the brentuximab patients are seen on the red curve, and you can see that there is about a 20% improvement in progression-free survival for these patients who receive maintenance with brentuximab compared to the patients who receive placebo. Um, there has not been any difference in overall survival, and that's really, in my opinion, be, uh, because of two reasons. 
Um, one reason is that the patients who were on the placebo arm who progressed were allowed to switch over to brintuximab. Um, and then the other thing is that now the survival for a patient who fails transplant in 2016 um, is actually much longer than, um, than what it used to be, and that's basically because of brintuximab. It's actually about six or seven years. And so now with um, about three-year follow-up from the Athera study, we wouldn't actually expect to see an overall survival benefit yet because um, we really haven't been following these patients out long enough. But, but once again, I don't think that we're going to see a difference because of the crossover. Um, so how do I use a Thera in, in my daily practice? Well, you know, I think of it, there, you know, there are certainly some pros to the, to the study. Uh, certainly there was associated with an improved progression-free survival. Maybe that translates into more cures. Um, and, and if that's the case, then maybe that translates into a reduced ne uh, need for allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is what we would consider for a patient who's failing an autotransplant. But on the other side, there is no survival advantage, so maybe that's something that we do need to consider. And there is more toxicity associated with brintuximab. We certainly see neuropathy, um, and that was certainly seen on the study. And you know, and, and you know, there's always the question: Is are, are we simply just delaying patients' progression, and they should we just wait and, and treat them when um, when they need it? Um, in general, I, I would I do consider brintuximab maintenance, and you know, and I think that the patients that we should consider it for are the higher risk patients, because those are the patients who were enrolled on the study. They, they had to have at least one of the risk factors, as many of which are listed here. Um, and so, and all the patients who were on the study also were brintuximab naive, uh, although we ge generally are giving brintuximab earlier on, and so mo most of our patients are not brintuximab naive. So I would consider it for a patient who's brintuximab naive, naive or who previously responded to brintuximab and who has one of the, at least one of the risk factors, such as relapse within one year of initial treatment, primary refractory, extranodal sighted disease, or if they're PET positive before transplant. Um, so moving on to checkpoint inhibitors. So um, we now are very much aware of the role of the PD-1 pathway in Hodgkin lymphoma, and it appears that this is an important pathway for allowing Hodgkin lymphoma cells to evade the immune system. And um, it, seem, it, it turns out that Hodgkin lymphoma seemed like a really good example for a disease to be evaluated with checkpoint inhibitors, and that's um, because of the extensive immune infiltrate that we see with, um, in Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as the almost universal expression of the ligand for PD-1, um, which is PDL1 or PDL2, which is uh, expressed due to alterations in the 9P24 chromosome or through EBV. Um, and it was actually found, um, it was, this is a very interesting analysis of patients in the frontline setting who had baseline biopsies who were all enrolled in the study in which they received Stanford 5. And there were about 100 patients in this analysis where they looked, using FISH, they looked at the 9P24 locus, and they found alterations in actually 97% of the patients um, in this series. Um, so this is certainly widespread in, in, in the frontline setting. And what I thought was interesting is that Patients who had advanced stage disease were more likely to have more copies of the 9P24 locus um, than patients with um, earlier stage disease. And um, more copies, which they had defined as 9P24 amplification, was associated with a, a reduced progression-free or a, a inferior progression-free survival. So it kind of suggests that having upregulation of this locus potentially allows patients to have a, a higher chance of evading the immune system. Um, and you know, potentially a, a higher chance of not having a great response to their frontline treatment. And maybe these are the patients who are more likely to, um, to respond to checkpoint inhibition. But I think that these are things that we need to be looking into further, and that's um, what is being evaluated in, in, in multiple clinical trials in the relapse setting. Um, so as we've all been alluding to, um, PD-1 blockade is very active in Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, this is a summary of the data from the phase one study with pembrolizumab in which there were 31 patients enrolled and um, the overall response rate was 65%. Uh, the phase two data for nivolumab enrolled 80 patients and this was a study that enrolled, all th this cohort of the study had patients who all had failed transplant and also had failed brintuximab. And again, the overall response rate was very similar at 66%. And as you can see from the waterfall plots Virtually every patient enrolled on these studies had some degree of clinical benefit. And the phase two da data for nivolumab is what has led to the recent approval. Um, so what's also striking about uh, treatment with the checkpoint inhibitors is the durability of response. Um, this is showing the, um, 
on the treatment scheme, uh, the ongoing treatment for patients who are currently on the phase two study, and these were all the responders that are shown here. Um, so there are of the 53 responders, almost two thirds of them remain on treatment, as you can see from the uh, black arrows. Um, and you know, many of those patients are, are approaching or are beyond a year of treatment. Um, so for the actual approved indication for nivolumab, it's for patients with relapse and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma following transplant and brintuximab. Um, and there are multiple settings in which nivolumab as well as pembrolizumab are being looked at in the investigation setting. As Craig mentioned, we will be opening a study um, with, in the frontline setting with um, ABVD for PET2 positive patients. Um, in the second line setting, there is a multicenter study looking at brintuximab plus nivolumab, um, which I'll mention again later, but uh, um, we actually don't have data results from that yet. Um, there will be data uh, presented uh, at this coming ASH. And then in the relapse and refractory setting, there's multiple novel combinations uh, based using nivolumab as well as pembrolizumab that are getting looked at. So switching gears to the second line setting, because this is a, um, an area where um, we've been trying to improve the outcomes for patients and, um, and, and, and a, a setting where I think that we really have an opportunity to try out some of these novel agents before we potentially bring them into the frontline setting. Um, so as far as the overall treatment approach for a patient who fails their frontline treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma, um, the, the treatment schema is then to give them some type of second-line chemotherapy and then to bring them to an autologous stem cell transplant. And this is the standard approach that's based upon um, two randomized studies that showed improved progression-free survival for patients who went to transplant in this setting. Um, and in general, um, it, it cures a, at least 50% of patients. Um, so as far as what do we choose as our second line treatment, where these are the um, older or standard treatments that have been, that we have used in the past, including ICE and DHAP and um, gemcitabine-based therapy, and basically they're all the same as far as if you, if, whether you're looking at by CAT scan criteria or by PET scan criteria, um, the response rate or the complete response rate to these regimens fair, or tend to be fairly similar. We looked back at our data, and this was most, this was all studies that were led by Craig Moskowitz, of multiple sequential studies that um, evaluated uh, second uh, ice-based treatment in the second-line setting for Hodgkin lymphoma and found that one of the most important prognostic factors, one of the pr most important predictors of, to um, decide how a patient was going to do after transplant was whether or not they were able to normalize their PET scan um, prior to transplant. We, we put functional imaging here because um, some of these studies were old enough that some of the, the patients had gallium scanning, um, but basically this was found to be the most important prognostic um, factor and led to the, and was the basis for the design of multiple studies after this in which we really used uh, the PET response as our endpoint in, in future studies. So um, one of the earlier studies was led by Craig, and, and, and this was initiated in 2004, and this was, again, a, a, a study for patients who had failed their frontline treatment, um, and they received ice-based chemotherapy, and then they had a PET scan, and if their PET scan was negative, they went on to transplant. If their PET scan was positive, he gave them all an additional uh, combination chemotherapy, gemcitabine-based chemotherapy with gemcitabine, venerolabine, and doxyl, and then, and then considered them for transplant. And these were the results from this study. And the um, blue and green line represents the patients who were PET negative before transplant. Um, and as you can see, the, the outcomes for these patients was quite good with about 80% of those patients progression free after transplant. And it turns out that those, I mean, those lines are interchangeable and that's you know, the, the you, what you can conclude from that is that it really didn't matter that some of these patients um, were able to become PET negative with ICE alone, and some of the patients required an additional non-cross-resistant chemotherapy regimen, such as gemcitabine uh, GVD. Um, the patients did the same whether or not it took one or two steps to get to their negative PET scan. Um, the red line represents the patients who were PET positive before transplant, and so those patients still had um, less favorable outcomes, which is what we would have expected. So using that same treatment paradigm, we designed uh, a study using brintuximab because at that time we were thinking, well, maybe brintuximab can allow us to avoid um, some of these stronger chemotherapy regimens that we're using in the second line setting um, and allow us to bring more patients to transplant um, in a PET negative state. 
Um, so on this study, we started with uh, patients who had failed their frontline treatment started with single agent brituximab, of which they received two cycles. And we actually gave it in a weekly base, uh, on a weekly schedule, and so they, they received basically a dose intense brituximab. Um, and then they were evaluated with PET, and those who had a negative PET scan, we brought right to transplant, and those who had persistent abnormalities on their PET scan received additional chemotherapy with augmented ice, followed by evaluation by PET scan, and then consideration for transplant. Um, and this is what we found. These were the results on that study. So there were 45 patients enrolled in that study, and 12 of those patients had a PET-negative response to brentuximab. So, um, and we actually used a very uh, stringent criteria for um, for PET negativity, this, they had to have a DOVIL2 response. Um, and so roughly about a third of the patients had a PET negative response, which is what we saw, which, which is what we also see in the post-transplant setting. Um, the rest of the patients, because they were not PET negative, they, they went on to augmented ice chemotherapy um, and then were reevaluated by PET. And overall, um, many of those patients became PET negative after augmented ice chemotherapy. And so this whole treatment paradigm, um, about 76% of the patients had a complete response or were PET negative going into transplant. And actually, all but one patient went to transplant from the study, and the one patient who didn't go out to transplant is because they were lost to follow up. So these were the results, and it looks very similar um, as we, that to the results that we saw with the ICE GVD study in, in that the top two lines, the green and the blue curves, represent the patients who um, were PET negative and received either just brentuximab alone and became PET negative or received brentuximab followed by augmented ice. And as you can see, those curves are interchangeable, but their progression-free survival is over 80%, so they, you know, they really did quite well. And then the bottom, the black curve, represents the patients who remained PET positive but what still went on to transplant. And actually, overall, those patients did better than how we would have expected, and we think that that might be because a considerable number of those patients did receive some radiation before going on to transplant. So we were happy with the results overall. The, the, the progression-free survival on the study was quite good, but um, we were a little disappointed that not more patients went on, uh, had a complete response to brentuximab alone. We would have liked to have fewer patients receive augmented ice. So we opened up a second cohort on the study in which we gave three cycles of brentuximab rather than two, hoping to have a higher complete response rate. And we actually didn't see a higher complete response rate. I mean, we only, it was only 20 patients that we enrolled on the second cohort, but still only about a third of the patients had a complete response to single agent brentuximab, whether we gave two or three cycles. Um, now we have um, um, still, the, oh, just about every patient on the study went on to transplant, and now we have quite a bit follow-up on the study, and these are the overall results at this time. And so we're not seeing any, any difference in outcome for the patients, whether they were on cohort one or cohort two. Um, the overall progression-free survival is about 80%, um, and so really that you know, is quite favorable. And, and once again, the, um, one of the most important prognostic factors is um, the patient's PET scan prior to transplant. So what do I think is the, most, the ideal uh, regimen for a patient in the second line setting? Um, well, to me, the ideal regimen would be a regimen that has a very high complete response rate, um, is potentially given in the outpatient setting, and um, allows us to avoid some of the stronger chemotherapy agents if, if that's possible. So these are the, um, this is, I'm circling the data that we currently have available of some of the newer regimens. Um, the top one is the regimen that I just presented. Um, the second study um, was a study led by Rob Chen um, using brentuximab in the second line setting. It was a very similar study as ours, and he saw a very similar complete response rate to single agent brentuximab. Um, the third and fourth study I'm going, studies I'm going to go into a little bit further, um, as they are, they do represent regimens that um, can be given over a shorter, a short, fairly short period of time. They're given in the outpatient setting, and their complete response rates were quite um, impressive and very similar to what we saw with our sequential brentuximab and augmented ice. Um, these other studies, uh, we don't have data yet, but these, uh, the data is coming. I mentioned brentuximab and nivolumab should be presented at this coming ASH. And there are other studies looking at um, brentuximab plus DHAP as well as brentuximab and, e and ESHAP, which we should be seeing um, in the near future as well. Um, so um, this was a study that just came out in the JCO. This is a bendamustine, gemcitabine, and veneralbine. Um, this was a regimen that was given once again to patients who had failed their frontline treatment. 
um, and they gave four cycles of treatment. The primary endpoint was a complete response. Um, and um, the study enrolled 59 patients, and these were the overall results. Um, as I mentioned before, the complete response rate was quite impressive with a, a, a response rate of 73%. Um, and the bottom curve shows the progression-free survival for the patients who were transplanted, um, and, and that is uh, at about 80%, which is similar to what we're seeing with our longer term, um, with, our, with our data as well. Um, ben, uh, another regimen is bendamustine plus brentuximab, um, which has not yet um, been published. It's been presented in abstract form. Um, and this, again, is another outpatient regimen um, that's fairly um, straightforward. Um, and this was a study in which patients, once again, who had failed their frontline treatment could receive two to six cycles of bendamustine plus brentuximab. Um, they didn't have to be um, go on to transplant. The transplant was optional. Um, and then they could receive brentuximab maintenance after that. Um, and so the complete response rate to this regimen also was quite high, uh, with a complete response rate of, of 74%. Um, only 75% of the patients were transplanted because they didn't have to be transplanted on the study. Um, one thing to note with this regimen, for some reason they saw a significant amount of infusion-related reactions, and some of those were quite um, severe. And so you have to give prophylactic premedication with this combination, and I don't think we really know why they, they saw that. Um, and the curves show the outcomes um, with, for the patients who were transplanted as well as all the patients. And the curve for the patient who were transplant, um, it's still a little early to say. Um, some of, for some reason, the progression-free survival does not look quite um, as high as you would expect considering that the majority of the patients did have a complete response to treatment. And so I think we need a little bit more follow-up um, before we can make a conclusion about this regimen. Um, so just as a summary, of how we are looking at incorporating these agents into the, into the Hodgkin lymphoma treatment paradigm in the frontline setting, as you already heard. Um, maybe we'll be using BVABD. Um, we need to see the echelon one results, um, and there'll be upcoming studies evaluating checkpoint inhibitors. In the second line setting, I think that um, evalu evaluating regimens by using PET as a surrogate for outcome um, has really been helpful in a way because it helps us to compare these regimens um, in the most objective way. But I actually wonder if that's going to um, be a problem now that we're looking at checkpoint inhibitors in the second line setting since um, PET scan results are not always as easy to interpret um, with checkpoint inhibitors. But at this point, we have fairly um, active options um, such as the brentuximab um, augmented ice sequential therapy, BV bendamustine, and then the bendamustine regimen. Um, all with similar PET negative rates. And um, we're awaiting the results of the uh, BV Nebo study, which um, will be so far, uh, we, we do have that open here. And you know, just as far as the patients that we've been taking care of here, you know, it certainly looks quite promising, but um, we don't have any official results yet. Um, in the post-transplant setting, um, I think this is really the opportunity to be looking at novel combinations um, that um, for because if they look promising, these are re combinations that we could potentially bring into the second line setting or even the first line setting. Um, and finally, um, I didn't really mention anything about allogeneic stem cell transplant, but there is something that we do consider for patients who fail auto transplant. And I think that we need, um, at this point, we need to figure out how to maximize the safety of allogeneic stem cell transplant, particularly in the setting of using uh, checkpoint inhibitors, um, and of which many of our patients will be getting in this setting now. Um, so I'm just going to end with a little theory about how to potentially combine some of the newer agents um, in the post-transplant setting. Um, and I think that we can think about, now, now I'm thinking about Hodgkin lymphoma so much more in, in the setting of anti-tumor immunity. And this is just um, look, showing the different steps of anti-tumor immunity where at the bottom we have release of the cancer antigens which then are taken up by dendritic cells and are traveled to the lymph nodes where we have expansion of T cells which then um, these tumor-specific T cells um, can then travel back to the tumor where they can um, directly impact and, and kill tumor cells, hopefully. Um, and right now, um, our theory, we believe that nivolumab and pembrolizumab probably act at this last point where they um, are a release on the break of these um, tumor-specific T cells that can then kill the tumor cells. Um, but many of the other drugs that we have that are active in Hodgkin lymphoma work at different parts of this pathway. Um, in particular, the, uh, the uh, chemotherapy-based treatments, um, 
help with uh, release of more tumor antigens. Um, JAK2 inhibitors um, have an impact on dendritic cell maturation, lenalidomide, HDAC inhibitors and mTOR inhibitors have an impact on, on T cell expansion. And I think that, you know, when looking at how these impact anti-tumor immunity in different ways, we can think about how to combine these um, in the most rational way. And really, you can think of a, a theory, you can, dis, you can come up with a reason to combine all of these treatments. Um, Dr. Yunus and, and Santos are, are leading a, a study here with, um, with pembrolizumab and antinostat um, and, um, as an example of um, ways to um, impact the antitumor immunity in, in various different ways and, and possibly get synergy. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank you for um, your attention. I'm really grateful to have worked here for 10 years, and I'm grateful for all the people that I've worked here. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you know, Craig Moskowitz has had such a tremendous impact on, on my career and has been such a great mentor, and I'm so happy that he is honored today. Um, and of course, Andy Zelenitz, who has also had a, a tremendous impact on my career, and I am honored to have been able to work with him throughout all these years and, and learn from him on a daily basis. Um, so thank you very much.